that. We've spoken about fractals. And a fractal is nothing more than a repeating pattern. That's all it is. It's just a repeating pattern. And Revelation 14, the first, second, and third angel's messages. First angel's message says, Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. So you've got all the components of the everlasting gospel in the first message, and then you've got the three. So that was Revelation 14. Where else did we see that pattern yesterday? Remember. Give me the book. Daniel. Yeah. Chapter five. Daniel chapter five. And who's the king? Belshazzar. And he doesn't fear God. Right. The handwriting on the wall. That's right. And he's gonna die. That's right. And his warning was what? Daniel chapter four. four his mm -hmm. granddad. And yeah. his granddad was warned for the twenty five twenty and then went into judgment. So you have this same pattern. Yeah. This idea of repeated is in built in the scriptures. It's in mm -hmm. fact it's embedded in the everlasting gospel. We have to see this. It's there. Then we saw this morning, this little pattern here. So here we are. This is the last days, LD. It's the binding off, and it's the closing work. And this is the time of the end. This is Adam. And this here is what? The message. One message, the message. The everlasting gospel. And so this is this message that's gone all the way through, and when you get to the end, because there's no there's nothing after the end, you're gonna make a conclusion to the matter because it's right at the end, and you're gonna summarize everything that you've taught before. So that's why Ellen White can say Genesis 3:15 is Revelation 14. You know, we we tend to say because she says it, it's true. Mm. And I think when we do that, often people don't understand that. They just say, well, if she says it, I agree with it. Yeah. But we don't understand why. Yeah. Why is she saying what she's saying? It's because this is a summary or a conclusion of everything that's gone before. But how many messages were there for the everlasting gospel? One here, one in Moses, one with um, the Persian kings, one with Christ, one with the Millerites, they're all everlasting gospels. So this is a summary of everything that you've said. In fact, this was the introduction to the whole thing. And this is the main body over and over again. Same story. So you're just repeating everything you've done before. So you can see that this concept philosophically works historically, prophetically. It works in the way Ellen White uses her language. It, it just works. Mm. It has integrity to the message. So here we are. We're in the... Finishing work, the closing work, let's expand that up like this. So we're here, the closing work. And she says we are in the closing work. And what do we need to do? We need to come to a conclusion because we're going to bind off the work. And so this is a copy or a miniature version of this. So let me take that out. And what we're saying is we've got this. Let me take all of these out. So you see you have the same thing here. You have this binding off, this binding off here, and that is a mini version of that. Yeah. <coughs> and the technical name for that is fractals. Once you get this down and you can understand it, it opens up scripture in a really profound and fundamental way. Because when you have two temple cleansings, you can do this. You can do the Millerites and the 144,000. First cleansing, second cleansing. Or you can say, let's zoom up in that history. So you're here. You say, first the SDAs, then the world. 
So you've gone into this last section, you've zoomed it up. Then you can say, well, let's zoom this bit up here. Mm -hmm. In SDAs, you've got first the priest, then the Levites. And it's the repeating pattern over and over again. Does the world have that? The world has to have it. it has the to two have sections? Oh, the two sections? Mm -hmm. uh, no, the, the world doesn't have two sections, but it's got an everlasting gospel mm -hmm. component yeah, in it. Yeah, because that's not really relevant to God's okay. people as such. And, and the reason for that is we're going to see that the whole theme of the everlasting gospel is done on a, on a backdrop of a marriage or a... Please. Marriage or a got feast, yeah. Got feast. Yeah. or a temple, temple oh, building. Yeah. yeah. So here's our temple. Sometimes you call it a church, but it's a temple, yeah. and you need someone to do something in that temple. Not the congregation. You need some workers in there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And who who's allowed to go into the into the temple? Who's the the priests. Temple? Levites. So you've got the priests, who are a subset of Levites, mm. but these people don't like getting their hands dirty. So they get the Levites to do all oh, the work. Levites are even prouder than them. They don't want to get their hands dirty. Oh. They don't like dealing with the mess. So they're going to, they're going to get some other people in to help them. Oh, okay. So there's a third group here. There's a third group who's supposed to do all the... Mm. Menial work. work. <laughs> Dogs, what is it? Yeah, oh, yeah the unpleasant work. They will the, take the blood the off. General. The general. So the, the menial altars. They, they, yeah, they, they, they do all the menial... Te these are labourers. Yes, labourers. Menial tasks. That's yeah. the job they it normally says that they gather the water and they cut the wood. They mm. kind of sanitise it all. So it doesn't look too bad. It doesn't sound too bad. The sanitised version is they collect the water and they find the wood for the burnt offerings. It doesn't tell you much more than that. Because the burnt offering, obviously the labour and all that would get pretty dirty and the, all the wood and um, inside the sanctuary, the showbread. They're not allowed inside. Oh, okay. Because they'd be They're not allowed inside. Way. Okay. No, in the, in the holy place, the Levites go in the holy place, don't they? Uh, the priests. Don't can only go in the holy place. No, I don't think so. Oh, it's the, only the only the high priest that can go into the most holy place, but the the the, uh, the priests can go into the holy place, but not into okay. the. Because the, you know when they go in and they put the blood on the horns on the four corners. Yeah. I think they have to do. I'm sure they can. All I know is, I I know what I know. Mm. Don't know what I don't know. Yeah. And it says in the scriptures, they do water and wood. Yeah. That, that's what I know about them. But there's three groups. And if we're identifying one, two, this would be the third group. Yeah. So that's why you know the world can't be divided into two. But I want us to get familiar with this, this zooming in and zooming out, this fractal working out. So the reason why we want to understand that is because so, so this is this is part of the discussion my brother and I were having last night after the meeting is Millerite history we'll just do a simple one we'll do 40 44 April October 44 this is the first and the second and the third angel's messages. I think everybody's reasonably comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying in our history is this model here. I'm not lining these up, but we're saying we've got a one, a two, and a three. And people get distressed on this mix and matching because what we've done is if we drop that down here and we had number two here it looks like we're shuffling this over here and we're doing this in moving this number two all the way across yeah that's what it looks like yeah but my contention is we're not doing that you can prove it in a variety of different ways there are, there are many models to do this but i'm going to use the model of fractals so this is just revision what we did this morning because in this story here we know that this was the story of the Protestants and this was the story of the Millerites. Mm -hmm. you, see? Yeah. you get that straight from history, we know that. And here this announcement of the second angel that says <coughs> you'll become part of Babylon and you've fallen away. So that concept of being fallen away means you're totally lost. It's not just 
So mm. here, these Protestants, they end up walking away from this whole message, even though they've been progressively getting there all the way through. So this becomes the last step or the close of probation for the Protestants, which would be at number three. They began it at number one, and here's this number two, yeah. which we often mark as the chart, the 43 chart. So you've got a one, a two, and a three here for the Millerite, uh, for the Protestants. Yeah. And then you've got the Millerites are going to start their journey, a one, a two, and a three, and it's the midnight cry. Mm. And I explained that a couple of days ago, how you can just track that couple, then it goes in, and it expands. So we've, we've done all that. Mm -hmm. So all I want to show you is that as soon as you've done this, you've got one level of understanding here, but you've got another one here, and you have another one here. And without making much comment about it, what you've lined up is a two and a one. These one and the two are lining up. You can see they're lined up here. So you know, in built into the Millerite timeline is a combining of the messages, regardless of what we're doing in our own timeline. It's already in built, and we recognize it's there in the Millerite history. So let's just pull this back all the way to here. Remember what did we say here? What comes after the empowerment of the message? On the reform line. Always, every time. The foundation. <coughs> foundation. So here's the foundation. I'm gonna I'm gonna use Moses' story in this one. Okay? We're gonna pull out of Millerite history and put Moses in it. It's the same thing. So this date here, 1840. In Moses' history, what is that? Period of Moses. Sorry? I mean, the time of the year? No, 1840. What is 1840 for Moses? Uh, the angel come down and then mm -hmm. uh, because Moses failed to circumcise the son. This is circumcision. Yeah. Circumcision is entering into covenant. So you know you're entering into covenant now. Then he's going to go where? Passes the test, goes into mm -hmm. Egypt. 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 Straight to Egypt. And the first thing he does when he gets to Egypt speaks to everybody and he says what? The elders. Yeah, he says what? They're, they're, also, they're already circumcised. Oh, okay. they, they, they have to be circumcised. Keep the Sabbath. Oh, he's mm. So, so yeah. the Sabbath comes in right here. Now they're keeping Sabbath, 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 all the way along until you're going to get to Pharaoh. Right. Because Pharaoh doesn't know what you're doing. Mm. So he finds out what you're doing after you've done it Says maybe everybody got sick on that one day. We'll give him another chance. You do it two or three times, he's got the point. And then he's going to wait for Moses to come because here's Moses is coming. What do we mark here in Moses' reform line? The second way mark normally. <laughs> they begin to have an argument. Moses and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh. And okay. this is the story of the snakes. Yes. So the, this is Where the they go to actually ask to let the people go. Yeah. yeah. So this is the snake story. And in that story, they all had this thing. And he says, I don't know who your God is. And you're just gonna, we're just going to put the bricks on you. You've got to make your own bricks. Yeah. Okay. So this is where we mark the work of the enemies. So the enemies are going to be doing their work. But they've been keeping this, this Sabbath for a long while. Yeah. And what's the foundation in that history? It's the Sabbath for Moses. But we mark it here as at number two. But in real life, where did it begin? All the way back here. He has the circumcision. He's in Egypt. And number two, straight away, is Sabbath reform. Sabbath reform is going to come all the way through. But we mark it here because we want to make a certain point. Yeah. But you've got here number one. And this number two here actually isn't there. It's down here. So in Bill, in Moses' story, you have the first and second angel messages coming at the same time. So this idea about at the end of the world we're combining these messages, it isn't technically accurate because it's we've been doing like it that. all the time. It's sin and righteousness. It's just now that we've recognised Yes, so now we've recognised that, we're going back and we're saying, actually, this is something that's gone all the time. And many people have come away from this message because of this misunderstanding. So it, it's always been there. Let's go back into Millerite history. So Millerite history is 1840. 
In other words, it says this is the greatest reformation since the reformation of the 16th century. Reformation means putting away of sin. So here you are, you're fearing God, but this is the one thing. There's this putting away of sin all the way through. So this, this reformation that's going through then becomes symbolised in this chart, which is why we mark it here. We put a date on it, 1842, and they start warring against it. Yeah. But this experience has gone all the way through here. So this number two that we're marking here actually begins here. And when do you think they actually produced the chart? I mean, it gets printed and published in May 42, but they've been thinking about this for a yeah. long time. Yeah. And by the way, this isn't, this isn't the first chart. Yeah. They've been producing a few charts. This is just a finished model. Yeah. So what you've got is chart after chart after chart after chart. And all of those charts are just refinements and they're all foundations. So you know that this foundation isn't kicking in in 42. Mm. It's kicking in from 40. So you have to put the number two right here. Yeah. You can go to any reform line and, and it's always same. going to be the same. Yeah, well, yeah. I suppose in a sense it's similar principle to the, the latter rain in the sense you've got the spring and then you've got the you know the showers and it's, then a, it's a different concept I, well i'm thinking it's a different in terms concept. of it being um things always I, I, it probably is a different concept probably a bad example but what i was trying to say is that generally things don't normally happen in an instant it's normally something that is progressive prior to the point is what i was trying to say when they start eating christ who is righteousness, eating the little book right there in 1840. Yeah. So progressiveness is what I was yeah. trying to get at, which the latter rain is progressive. So that was the point I was bringing, not so much that it was a direct analogy. Here's the time of Christ. Mm. AD 27, this is John the Baptist, number one. Mm -hmm. AD 28, this is Christ, number two. But when does Christ get anointed? Yeah, at his yeah, baptism. Yeah, yeah. So Christ, the number two, is actually Starting first yeah. introduced mm. here. Mm. And he begins his work. Well, Patrick mentioned this. You've got, you've got marriage at Cana. So he begins his work during this time. He's collecting his disciples. A lot of pre-work is being done here. Yeah. So the second angel is having an increase of knowledge, or it's rising up, before it comes to its peak here. Yeah. So you know the second angel's message in the time of Christ actually was there yeah. but it's fully manifested or viewed here which yes. is why we put it here but really the, the beginning of it was down here over and over again you see these same yeah. Yeah. concepts yeah we discussed that one yesterday yeah. did you was it this you? morning you must increase i must decrease no no i mean with christ baptism being 27, not 30, like that was on a chart. His well. public ministry begins later, but he begins already his work. Yeah. His yeah. So that's what, that's what we summarize this morning. So when we're going to start looking at the everlasting gospel in this way, this is nothing new. It, it's, also like, it's, it's something that's already been there from the very beginning, but we just didn't notice it. Or we did. I can't say no one didn't, no one, no one uh, didn't notice it, but we didn't understand the implications of, of what it was, so we just, we were simplifying it, and we, we still do, we still put them separate, because we want to make this clarity, but sometimes that clarity obscures something, and it causes people to stumble on this issue, but, but as, again, you can come up, you can deal with this issue from a totally different perspective, I'll just give you one simple one. Um, This is 9-11, and this is Sunday law. Mm. So this is if you, depending on how much you know about the message. Here at Midnight Cry, this is Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 is right here. And people were asking earlier on, the Hazon, the Maria, and the Marah vision. People are asking all about that. <clears throat> and all of this, the Marais and the Marat, is all in this history here. Midnight Cry. And the prehistory is Hazon. Okay. 
that. So here's the zone, and then you come to the Maria Mara experience. But if you go and check Daniel chapter 10, and he sees Christ, where is he? Where is Christ? So if we go to Daniel chapter 8, we're in Daniel 8, 14, and Daniel, so I put 10 here, and we put Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, Daniel is looking up into heaven, and he sees a sanctuary being cleansed. But what is, who does he see inside that sanctuary? He sees Christ. But it's the cleansing of the sanctuary, the of atonement. So where is Christ? It's in the most holy place. It's the most holy place. If it's the most holy place there, and that vision in Daniel 8, 14 is the Maria vision. So you come to Daniel 10, same story. Where is Christ here? Same place. Must be in the most holy place. So you know that the midnight cry experience is an experience of the most holy place. We know that. By definition, it's the, as soon as you get to midnight cry, it's like opening the curtains and having a look inside the most holy place. But we've been in the most holy place since when? 1844. Mm. The problem is, most of us, all of us, many of us, <laughs> haven't had an experience. Mm. We haven't really had a peak in there. And when you get this peak in there, you get an experience which is different. Something, a revelation of who Christ is and who you are. Mm. There's some dynamic difference because We've professed to be in there, but we haven't really entered into it in an experimental way. So, Amara. Yes, yes, that, this, this, this Maria and Mara experience that, that we haven't really had before that. But that's not the point I want to make. Here's the most holy place. So, here's the most holy place, and this is the Ark as a covenant, and you've got Christ ministering here. So we're here. And if this is the most holy place, what's missing in that imagery? The angels. The angels. So you've got one angel and one angel. Okay? So you've got an angel, Christ and the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and then another angel. So all of this is the Marah and the Maria, the Maria and the Marah vision, there it is, because it, it was Christ. And when is this happening? Midnight. midnight cry. So here's the midnight cry. And then you've got this angel and this angel. Okay. So this angel is Revelation 18, verse 4. That angel here. The third angel's message, this chart. Yeah. And then you've got another angel there. You've only got one angel. So here's the second angel, and here's the first angel. If you only got two angels, you have to have three messages. And only an angel can give a message. No one else is allowed to give a message except an angel. So if there's only one angel here, and he's standing right here, he has to give message number one and message number two. So from the sanctuary, from the model of the sanctuary, when you superimpose that onto a reform line, you know by definition, because you've only got two angels, did the Millerites ever go into the most holy place? They didn't. Because the Millerites' definition is the first and second angel's messages. So right. you get into 1844, it's a different experience. Yeah. So the third angel's message is for us. Here we are, the third angel's message. So we're in the third angel's message. And this is the experience you can have the third angel's message. You look into the most holy place. They couldn't have done because they had they thought the sanctuary was the earth. So you know that they couldn't have experienced that. So here's the appearance of Christ that you have at midnight cry. And that model is on what chart? This chart, first and second angels. Or the third. So it's in the right place, because this is a chart for the 144,000. That's the chart for the Millerite. Yeah. It's got it here, and you can see exactly what's on there, is what I've drawn. Yeah. 
this here, where do you see this person? You see this person at midnight, midnight cry. You see him here. And who directed you to him? This angel and this angel, because they're covering him. Yeah. So you've only got two angels. Those two angels are the everlasting gods. They have to be, because we've put it on to reform line, but you've got three messages to deal with. Yeah. So this concept that we had, one and two, justification and sanctification, at the same point, Revelation 18 teaches you the first and second angel messages are at the same point. The story of Christ, the story of Moses, the story of the Millerites, it teaches you that the first and second angel messages come at the same time. They're all telling you the same story. That's, I think, four testimonies I've given there. Mm -hmm. So when you bring it in here, just the imagery directs you in the same place. You have to put one and two, because you've got to put three messages in, yeah. and you've only got two angels to do it with. And so this angel, he has to be here at his place, 9-11, Sunday Lord, verses 1 to 3, Revelation 18. So you can see it through the sanctuary system. This modelling is all correct. Mm. Well, there's much more we could do with this. We'll just do one small piece, which this doesn't do it justice, by the way. I always find it dangerous to to go through material too quickly, but it's my, it's my last opportunity to say something. Zechariah chapter 4. Everybody know about Zechariah chapter 4? Don't even need to turn to yeah, the book. Yeah, Zechariah chapter 4 is a vision of a man who's asleep. He's sleeping, or maybe we want to, maybe if you're not familiar with it. Well, I'm Zechariah kind of chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Yes. And the angel that talked with me, verse 1, came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of sleep. Yes. So he's sleeping. Who must he be? Not Lady Sian. Not Lady Sian? No. Lady Sian oh, so oh, Sorry. Um, I'm five virgins. That's the yes, virgin. Yes. yes. One of the, One of the ten virgins. Yes. So he's the virgin because he's sleeping. Yeah. So he's going to be waking out of sleep. When you when you wake out of sleep, at the at the midnight cry. Amen. So where are we? We're here. Zechariah chapter four. We're right here, midnight cry, same place. We've 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 tackled this thing three or four times over. Now we're going to fifth testimony book of Zechariah. And the reason why this is good because there's a lot of information about the book of Zechariah chapter four, and most Adventists understand this, otherwise I answer this extensively in many, many different ways. I've never heard anyone preach on Zechariah 4, I don't think. Oh, no, no. Uh, and I'm a born Seventh-day Adventist. So, there's loads of things we can talk about this, but I want to just drop down to verse 3. Yeah. How many olive trees are there? Two. Two, Two olive trees. We're at the midnight cry here, and there's two olive trees. One yeah. and two, two olive trees. Before we do that, go any further, if we went to Revelation 11, Revelation 11 talks about France. We should be familiar with that story. Yeah. It talks about France, and France is going to come and attack somebody. Two people, yes. the two witnesses. How many? Yes. Two witnesses. Yeah. And it says those two witnesses are what? The the it doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say that, but that's what we've been told. Oh, two witnesses. It doesn't say that. Let's yeah. go to the two olive trees. It doesn't yeah. say that. They, they are the two olive trees. These are the two olive trees of yeah, the candle standing forward. Which verse? Verse 4. Mm. You read the verse 4 to us? Yeah. 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 Read it out aloud to us. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay, so we're saying the two witnesses are the Old and New Testament, yeah. which is the Word of God, which is a message. Yeah. So you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this is coming back into Zechariah chapter 4. 
So here you come back to Zechariah 4. How much of the Bible is this, by the way? How much of the Bible is it? It's the whole of the New Testament. That's the whole of the Bible. And the Bible is what? The seed. The seed. Because the seed is Christ, the Bible, and a human being. All three things. Yeah. It says, I don't know where we got the Old and New Testament from. Well, no, two because it doesn't say that in the Bible. Oh, I, I know. Know what I, I'm being rhetorical when I say that. Because if you check what it says in there, it tells you that there are people who can do things. And one of them can turn water into blood. Who can turn water into blood? Jesus. I don't think Jesus ever turns water into blood. It's into wine. Yeah, that's, that's why Jesus. Moses he goes and strikes the river Nile with his stick oh, and he turns into <coughs> blood yeah so this one is Moses and then it says another one can bring down fire from heaven Elijah. who can bring down fire from Elijah. heaven yeah. so do you know this is Moses and Elijah uh, he can shut heaven and shut heaven yeah there are other characteristics so here we've got Elijah so this is not new and old testament but it is but now it's Moses and Elijah, it's two people. And we're already dealing with Elijah. What is the Elijah message? Third angel's, Third angel's message. Thank you. All the way down here, Third <laughs> angel's message. So we know we're on the right track. Let's go, if you go to Zechariah now, it calls them these two olive trees. Yeah. And then there's branches that come down and they do what? Three pipes. Pour this oil. And what is the pipe? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> it's the message. Yeah. So it's the message in this pipe. And so this Old Testament and this New Testament is doing what? It's because it says there's a branch that drips the oil from the branch. Yeah, so so that's the branch of the tree. And then it carries it all the way through this pipe into, if you read the story back on it, it actually enters into a human being. Mm. So here you have the Old Testament which is a symbol of this pipe, because it's multiple symbols, because it's a message. The Old Testament has got a message. The New Testament has got a message. And both those messages are coming into the hearts of a human being. So you've only got two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And by the way, do you know Moses and Elijah are the same person? Because when they ask John the Baptist who he is, you've got a choice of two people, mm. Moses or Elijah. And why do they say it's Moses and Elijah? Because Every, everybody in that history, every Jew knows one thing. They know, they know Moses got resurrected. Everybody knows Moses got They knew that. <coughs> so they're expecting, because he says, Moses says, another prophet's going to come after me. Yeah. He looks exactly the same as I am. So yeah. when he gets resurrected, they're thinking, he's going to come back. Yeah. And when Elijah got translated, what was everybody doing after he got translated? They were all looking for him. They say, he's taken up somewhere, maybe he's going to be transported somewhere else. They're all looking for him. So they're the same man. Moses and Elijah are the same person. So here you have this singular person whose singular message that is used in the Old and New Testament, and you've only got two of them. And in the Old and New Testament, the Bible, there's only one message in the Bible. It's the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is a three-step prophetic test one, two, three, but you've only got two people to do it, you don't have three. If you don't have three, only Elijah and Moses are the only people that can give this testimony. No one else is allowed to do it. Mm. Dan, no one else, only this is two people. Uh, but they've got, to, they've got to deliver three messages between them. So how do you deliver three messages between two people? Because this symbology is not Millerite history. It's not Revelation 14 symbology, this is Revelation 18 symbology. No, Fernanda, when you look at it in Zechariah 4, <coughs> it says the two olive trees drain into one candelabra, and when you look at it in Revelation 11, it, they drain into two candelabras. So is there a significance there? Is there is. We have to... We have to <laughs> is that like one the first message and the first angel and then two angels coming at the same time or <coughs> I don't know. I don't know <coughs> what the 
Oh, interesting, man. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do there, but hopefully we can just see it at this level. Yeah. Is it because Zechariah was uh, the Old Testament uh, revelation work? We're in the New Testament, so we have uh, two witnesses instead of one? Um, I don't think so, because they have to be the same story. Yeah. It, it, it's a bit more sophisticated than, than that, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, so, I want to just make one more point. One more point. Interesting to post the last the book of last book of oh, not quite the last book. Did you know this can be a larger message? No, it's always just it has to have done. It will be the same. Because what is he warning everybody? He says, prepare for that angel. And who was that angel that came down? The angel of death. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> what does Moses mean by the way? It means drawn out or taken out. And you know, often we say it's because he got taken out of the river. Yeah. But it's not. Because he's got taken out of Egypt. Yeah. He's the person who gets taken out of Egypt and he becomes a symbol or a figure for God's people. Yeah. And where are we getting taken out of? The world. Egypt. Yeah. We've been taken out of Egypt. Yeah. yeah. We're going to come out of Egypt. So Moses' his name isn't just the story that he's taken out of a river, which is what we teach. No. But it's really that he's taken out of Egypt in his life. That's what his name really means, to be drawn That's out. That's what we teach. Now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now. One more point. <clears throat> if this is the first angel's message, and this is the second angel's no. message, and this is 9-11, what's the message of the second angel? And how loud is it? I think he says mighty Lee. Cried mightily. Babylon is falling, is falling. This is Revelation 18, verse 2. And have a look at what verse 1 says. 18, verse 1. What, is the, what does that angel say? Um, great power. What does he say? It doesn't say anything. So, what we want to understand is where are we going to find the first angel's message? Because we have to find the message. No. Um, so, let me just do a quick other line here. Here's the Sunday law, close of probation, 9-11. We can mark that this is the history of Thyatira. Have we done that here? Have we done Revelation 6? No. We haven't done that. So, this is Thyatira. Persecution, where you've got Jezebel. Who's Jezebel married to? Ahab. Ahab. And she's got false prophets. So you know Jezebel, Ahab, and false prophet comes into this story. This is the Sunday law time period. If this is Thyatira, that's the false church. What's the church that comes before Thyatira? Backwards, yeah. So we're in Pergamos. Okay. And where's not what church is 911 going to come into then? So we're in the same place here, Pergamos. So we're in the, So let's go to Revelation chapter two. I thought that was Philadelphia. It is. Well, Sardis is after. Sardis is after. There's multiple experiences going on. This is the church Adventist, the whole thing. This is when the church is going to be taken into this period where there's going to be dark ages. The reason you know that is. Because what happens in the year 538? Papacy ascends. Papacy ascends, and when it ascends, it does what? It makes a Sunday law. And this kicks off the Dark Ages until 1798. And this Dark Ages is 1260 years of papal supremacy, where they're going to do persecution against God's people. And what church is that? Thyatira. So you know the 538 Sunday law is marking the Sunday law that we mark in prophetic history. 
So all you need to do is, if you want to know what the characteristics of this Sunday law is, go and find out what the 538 one. That was the, I think it was the second church conference in Orleans. I think it was number two. They had about ten of them or something. Or it might have been the sixth. It's either the sixth or the second conference, Catholic conference in France, in Orleans. They have it in 538 and they're dealing with the Sunday law issue. There's been another Sunday law back here, uh, but we're not going to address that one. We just at it. So we've got Pergamos and Thyatira. Let's go to Dan uh, Revelation 2. We're going to look in verse 17, because this is the history that we're in. Before we read the verse, Revelation 10, Christ has come down to earth and he's got what in his hand? A book. And you're required to eat the book. And if you superimpose that with Ezekiel, when you eat the book, what are you supposed to do after you've eaten? Speak. And what are the words you're supposed to speak? The words that are in the book. So whatever you eat, that's what you speak. And this eating is eating the Bible, and the speaking is you're going to repeat what's in the Bible, which is a message, because we said here, the messengers are going to speak what they've eaten and they received it from Christ. Christ comes down, gives you a message, you need to eat the message, then you need to speak it. See that connection there? Mm -hmm. So, we need to look at something that's eating. You go to all the stories about eating and you're going to see that eating is always dealing with this story of eating the word of God. So let's go to Revelation 2.17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, so what are you required to do? Overcome. Okay, you need to overcome in the Sunday law time period or before the Sunday law. What are you supposed to be before. before? Okay, so we're in the right place. Him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden, hidden manna. manna. Mm. So here's eating, what do you eat? You eat manna. And what is manna? Right? It's angels' food. Okay, and who are the angels? We just marked them here. Here's the angels. And when it says angels' food, you've got to ask yourself the question, is this the food that angels eat, or is it the food that angels give you to eat? Mm -hmm. Which one? Must be what they give you. Yeah. Because here they are, the two angels, and what are they doing? They're pouring, oil, they're pouring this food down here and yeah. they're giving you food to eat. So this angel's food is the food that angels give you. And who are the angels here? Moses and Elijah, the Old Testament or the New Testament. But these are human beings that we're dealing with. So these angels are the three angels <coughs> and they're giving food. Amen. So let's bring that into this history. So here's this manna. But what did it say about the manna? It's hidden. <laughs> hidden. If it's hidden, that means you can't see it. Let's read the verse again. If it's hidden, if I hid something, what senses do you need to do to find that thing? If you hide something, what you've already got five senses in your body. What sense do you need if I hide something? You need sight, don't you? Yeah. So I've got hidden and I've put C. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of the verse and tell me what it talks about seeing anything. <laughs> when it does it say anything about eyesight? What sense is it saying? Hearing. 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 So it's, it's not message. talking about eyes, it's talking about ears. So even though it says it's hidden, it's talking about a hearing, not a seeing. So, the reason is that, because this is angel's food, and angel's food is a message that you have to eat, and the message is something that you hear. By the way, when you take symbology together, an eye in the Bible is the same as an ear in the Bible, is the same as a heart in the Bible. All of these three things are exactly the same thing. So when the Bible says having eyes they don't see, having ears they don't hear, and their hearts are wax gross, it's all the same thing. Repeat an enlargement. When you know that, 
you can go to many Bible verses and they begin to make sense what's being addressed. So, so it's the heart. It's the heart. You're saying. No, it really means the heart, or that's what was being worked on. So this is the lower powers, your emotions, mm. your pride, your passion. That's what all that is dealing with. That's what the eye is. So here we are. Um, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So here's the Spirit speaking to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, written in which no man knoweth, save him that receiveth it. So I'm not going to deal with that bit, but I just want to deal with the hidden manna. So this is the hidden manna that's being dealt with. Let's go into Revelation 18. We've, we've got first, second, third angel's messages. What's being hidden to us that we can't hear? That first angel's message. We can't hear his first angel's message. And this is tying up in the same history as Pergamos. And Pergamos says, the reason why you can't hear it is because it's hidden. So here, you've got a hidden manna, or what we would call a message. Is it the same thing? So you've got the first angel's message. He definitely is saying something, but it's so quiet, it's hidden. And then you've got the second one, which is so loud, <coughs> everybody can hear it because it's a mighty voice. So what is the Lord trying to teach us in this? He's trying to teach us this beautiful truth, I think. Let's go <coughs> and put Millerite history here, and we'll put our own history here. So here's number two, here's number one, one and two. This is the second angel's message. It says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So I think Brother Patrick did this. This, this Babylon that he's speaking to, who's he speaking to? Another right history. The Protestant churches. Only the Protestant churches, because everyone here outside of this is already Babylon. They're already Babylon. Every single church in Europe is already Babylon. The only free people, Christian free in, set, in that sense, are the Protestants in America. Because they escaped, they came out of Babylon, saw this. And the papacy wants it back. So here, it's going to get America back. So it says Babylon is fallen. And who is this being addressed to? The Protestants. <coughs> in the United States. Now, if we go to, I don't think the image is there, here's the earth, and there's a beast that's coming out of the earth. Revelation 13, how many horns has this beast got? Two. Do we need to read it? No. I'm sorry, I'm about to it. Revelation 13. Yeah. There are two beasts in Revelation 13, and my sister was thinking of the first one. And I was thinking of the second one. Verse 11. And I behold another beast coming out of the earth, not the sea. Yeah. That was the one that she was thinking yeah. of. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So it's two horns, and this is the United States. Yeah. This horn here is Protestantism, and this horn here is Republicanism. And I did go through this the other day. And what makes America strong? <laughs> Separation of church and state. If you want to destroy America, how do you destroy America? You grab hold of the beast and you chop its horns off. A beast without any horns doesn't have any power because the horn represents power. So here's the papacy with its saw. It's going to come down and it's going to cut this horn off here. Take the horn of America. What horn did it cut off? When did he cut it off? Right here. It cut the horn off. Scalped it, if you like. It took the horn down of America in 1844, April 19. So if you're okay with that, the papacy has already done half the job. So you've got to take one more horn down. So the question is, when do you take a horn down? Take it down at the second angel. Take it down at the second angel. Here we have the second angel at 
And what's the horn that's going to be taken down now? You've only got one horn left. The horn of republicanism. That gets taken down. And the way you know that this got taken down is because five testimonies, this is the one that Brother Patrick gave us the other day. Yeah. <coughs> Five Testimonies, page 711. Any movement in favour of religious legislation is really an act of concession to the papacy. So here you can see that America, if it does anything that legislates in the wrong direction, it's doing something towards the papacy, a concession. And what happens here at 9-11 is that you have the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act, Five Testimonies, page 711, paragraph 4. 5T711, paragraph 4. Um, so then they do the Patriot Act, and the Patriot Act essentially undermines the Constitution. And it says here, any movement in favour of religious legislation, so they've, re they've legislated against this... Um, whatever you want to call it, they're, they're legislating to get somebody, and it's called the Patriot Act, and this is affecting the Constitution. And that's happening here at 9-11. So we know that. So here you go, the second angel, we're going to have Babylon is fallen, is fallen. How loud was that cry? Oh, Mightily. That cry was so loud, it went around the world. Every human being on this planet heard that second angel screaming out at 9-11 when the Twin Towers fell down. When the towers fell down, that was the statement that everybody understands that the second angel's message has arrived. The towers have been taken down because the United States its government has now fallen because they've now destroyed the beginning of the destruction of the Constitution and they've legislated against it. They were really affecting the Constitution when they went into the, with the papacy, but now they're legislating upon it at 9-11. But there's another message. So this is the mighty one here. And what did we learn that the theme of Moses is? Christ's one is... So two temple cleansings, Millerite history is, Pablo of the Ten Virgins, the marriage. And what's the theme of Moses? God's people are living where? In the land. And the theme is, when the land is judged, the people are judged at the same time. God's people are judged at the same time that the land is judged. That's the theme of Moses. We'll take that theme, bring it in here. Right here, when the first angel, sorry, the second angel message cries mount mightily, who is this aimed at? This is the United States, and it's telling the whole world what has happened. To tell the whole world, you have to give a mighty cry for it to hear that voice. But this one is a silent, quiet voice, because this one's only meant for Adventism. So here's this quiet voice that no one in the planet can even figure out or hear or understand. So this one here is a first angel's message which says, Fear God, repent, and give him glory, because the Sunday law is about to hear. And this is the message of warning and invitation if you get it correct. So this first angel's message was given to Adventism, and we should have heard it at 9-11 if we'd been studying the word of God. And it's so quiet that nobody in Adventism are even listening because they can't hear it. But it's certainly not meant for the world. But this one was meant for the world so the world could all wake up and, hear, and know clearly this, this second angel is not for Adventism. This one was for Adventism to get your act ready. This one is a warning to the whole world that Babylon has fallen, has fallen. The end is already here. And if the end's already here, you could demonstrate the threefold union is already there, but that's another story. 
but this is the explanation at 9-11 why you have these two angels messages here at singular angel you can see it demonstrated from Zachariah from the study of um, the sanctuary model from all every single reform line gives you the same thing the first and second come at the same point mm. and Revelation 18 in its very structure teaches you the same this is a re recurring repeating theme mm. we lost people on this message needlessly if they had just waited a little longer for the explanation to come everything would have been made plain upon tables as he said and they would have kept on running with us it really I mean some people here are new and even though they didn't get everything you can see it's not it's not a fairy tale it's, it's embedded in the word you can see it's there and people have just walked away from the message needlessly because you know what this message does it creates two classes, it creates two <laughs> classes through esoteric imagery you know manner and it's this logic that you have to have it this way it, it does all of this and it creates two classes of people so when I say needlessly you know, I'm not judging anybody but the point I'm making is this confronts a human being and they have to make decisions and these are eternal decisions that we're making whether or not we're going to accept or reject these truths but the thing that everybody has stumbled on plus some other stuff is this issue of the combining of the message and it's, it's the test that's shaking God's people today it, and, it's, and it's going to continue to this issue is going to get worse as we're confronted more and more with the implications of what this is teaching so I don't think we've even addressed that as a movement, I don't think we've understood the full implications we've seen this at an intellectual level and I think we're going to enter into an experience based upon this intellectual understanding that the combining of the messages is the test that's coming to us and you have to see it because you can see it everywhere now we have to understand so what what does it mean and I'm saying I'm not 100% sure yet what it means because it's the experience but what I mean by that I know what it means because it's either going to produce righteousness or you're going to fall I know that but it's something that you have to taste and see not something that you can intellectualize because we've done all the intellectual bit First and second, it's no, all saying, the way through. You know, totally see, you know, when it, it's going to change from the experiential level we're having, knowing knowledge level to a more of a Mara situation. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the is Marer right? is here. Yeah. We know the Marer is here, but we've got all this to still contend with. We spoke about this yesterday, or the day before. Mm -hmm. You've got to watch your chips can't play with them yes, here. Yes. They've got to be dealt with already. You can't be on the chips thing now. We've got to deal with the stuff I here. Like and it says, um, faith comes by hearing of the word of God. And this is the faith that we have to get by the message by the now hearing. to enter into the experience of the most holy place. And it says you have to enter into the most holy Which place by midnight. faith. And it only comes yes. by the message. Yes, yes. So here's midnight. Yeah, that's okay, well, midnight's just, here. We, we yeah. have no idea how close we are to that, do we? Because it's just... We know, we know one close. thing about it. Yeah. What, one thing we do know is this. Whether you've been here for a long time, or whether you're brand new, one thing we do know is there's enough time. That's what we do know. We don't know it in days or weeks or months or years, but we know one thing, there's enough time. Wherever you are on your journey, there's enough time. That's the promise that we have to hold on to. We mustn't come to the, to the position that there's no time. So that's one thing. And the other thing we do know is this. There's enough time to study your Bibles properly. There's enough time for that. And there isn't time to waste. And time wasting is skimming over scriptures. What, when you're at school, it's called cramming. Yeah. If, if you cram, you're going to be in trouble. You'll fail your exams. You're going to fail your exams if you cram. What you have to do is study. There's plenty of time to study. Get some, as I suggested, get some detailed bits of so you've got on that. The rest of it, get an overview. Understand about where we are. That's easy. You just, you just passively sit and watch a video. That's fine. That's like... That's passive. That's going to undamage too bad. But that's not studying. No. And you can't study everything on this message. Nobody can, and nobody is, and nobody does. 
whether you're experienced or not, you should only study one bit, get that under your belt and get another one. It's not if you know two pieces or 200 pieces, that's not the problem. It doesn't matter if you've got five talents or one. It doesn't matter if you've been here one week or 10 years. It's the quality, not quantity. Yeah. We really have to understand that, that there's enough time to study your Bible. Don't think, I have to know all the latest bits and pieces and just watch the videos and just get scared and more scared about what's going on, see your unworthiness and don't deal with this. So like presidential elections the 28th of November, so after that. That kind of mentality, yeah. 28th of November, when the president, you're not done unless something unless happens. Because if you're done, we're all done. Yeah. That's what, but we haven't got any indication that on that 8th of November that it's going to be there. There's no indication to, no, to say that. that I, I know, but people have got that fear. Yeah. Because we're introducing the issue of the last president. And it's so close. And it's fear mongering. Yeah. And I said this a couple of days ago a message should not introduce fear mongering. We should have a godly fear, fear God, but not fear mongering. Not a hysterical fear. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And we shouldn't do that to ourselves. Often we do that to ourselves. Yeah. Because yeah. we keep on looking in mirrors. Look in the mirror at here and let it do its work. And at the moment, look to Christ. The more you look to yourself, you yeah. just become, it just becomes a hopeless situation. <laughs> and how do you look to Christ? How do you look to Christ? In his word. What is this vision? Yeah. What is this vision? Hazon. The Hazon. You look at the Hazon vision. Study the Hazon vision. That will convert you. The Hazon vision has the power to change your life. In fact, not only it was designed to do that. It was designed to change your life. And then the icing on the cake. Yeah. It's the dangerous message. Look, it's the career vision. Both. 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 But this is the one because this has got the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary and the Sabbath. So this is because it's, it's the foundation of the pillars. It's all on there anyway. Obviously. It's exactly the same chart. Yeah. This has got those two extras. Yeah. You need to look at the Hazon vision. That's what develops <coughs> character. Let's read on. We Okay, so let's turn to the page with five manuscript releases, page 128. Five MR, 128, paragraph one. The words were spoken to me, tell my people that time is short. Every effort is now to be made to exalt the truth. What's the truth? The, the vision, the 20 by 20. So we should make every effort to exalt the truth. Get everything you can to promulgate this chart. I don't mean print lots of them and hand them out to your church brethren, but it's the information that's on here. This yeah. is the Hazon vision, 20 by 20. Give this information, it says, Every effort is now to be made to exhort 2520. Where are you looking from? Page four. Five oh, MR, page 128. Yeah. Words are spoken to me. Tell my people that time is short. Every effort is now to be made to exhort the truth. In the city's large and small, the message is to be proclaimed. The third angel's message says the message, which is the third angel's message, a singular message. Let me rephrase that. In the city, it's largest for the message to be proclaimed, full stop. The third angel's message is to be united with the second angel's message and is to be proclaimed with great power in our large cities. Thus will be given with a loud voice the message that is to prepare a people for the coming of the king. So what's that loud voice that she's talking about here? Combination of the third and second. second. Revelation 18 verse 2, this loud voice is this message here, the mighty cry, the loud voice. So we know that. Yep, yep. Thus will be given with a loud voice the message that he prepared people for the coming of the king. 
But this loud voice is what? She just defined it. It says, the third angel's message is to be united with the second angel's message and is to be proclaimed with great power in our large cities. Thus will be given with a loud voice the message that is to be prepared for people for the coming of the king. So let's just do this quickly then. Let's take all this out. If you dream at night time, dream about this. This is, is enough power just looking at that in your dreams to change you. The everlasting gospel, you look at that most holy place, it will change your experience. Um, the third angel's message is to be united with the second angel's message. So here we are, our history, you've got the second angel's message and the third angel's message. And the first angel's message. Yeah. But, is that what she's saying? Is she saying unite this with this? That's the question. How do we read this passage? I'll show you how I read the passage. We're in 1798. 1840, 44, 44. First, second, third angel's messages. Okay, with that, the third angel's message has been running through history. In the cities, large and small, the message is to be proclaimed. What's the message that you need to proclaim? The third angel's message is to be united with the second angel's message. So here's the third angel's message running through history, and what do you want to join to it? The second angel's message here, you want to join to it. But, okay, where is this? This is Revelation, verse Just two, verses 2 and 3. So here's verses 2 and 3. The second angel is going to join it. But elsewhere, Ellen White is going to say this. You've got the third angel's message running through history. And then she says this angel is going to receive power when the earth is lightened with his glory. And what angel is that? First angel's message. So let's do this logic. He says, this is the same. Therefore, this and this must be the same event. Is he looking troubled? <laughs> or is that okay? No, it's okay, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So I was just trying to think of the, you know, Revelation just four then, just think of six or something. There. But Revelation the, the six, angel. Revelation 14 is here. This is 14. Yeah, but you just see we've got 1 a.m. And you like can, you combine glory. The glory. Yeah, so yes. is that 14, 6? Oh, no, this is the earth is lighting with his glory. Okay. This is slightly different. So you've got the first and second angel's message. So you've got this, all this structure built in that this and this are the same point. So right here, what you're saying, in the cities, large and small, the message is proclaimed. The third angel's message is to be united with the second angel's message. The third angel's message is this one here, the historical third angel, running through history, is going to unite with the second. And is to be proclaimed with great power in our large cities. So here you are, when this angel comes down, then you're going to proclaim with a mighty cry, a loud voice. The whole world's going to hear that towers came down and America is finished because that's what the second is doing but she'll tell you in another place that the earth is going to be lighting with its glory when the first angel comes down she doesn't call it the first angel she says that the earth is lightened when the angel of Revelation 18 joins this one but she's talking about the first angel so she talks about both of these as parallel events that are happening essentially at the same time they're not parallel there can I, can I say on your last 
Yeah. 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 When the first angel started, the uh, third angel started its message, the third angel's message carries the first and second angel with it. Anyway. Yeah. When it comes to our history. So, no, just straight up. Oh, the third yeah, angel has yeah. always carried the third. Yeah. Hang on. The third angel always carries the first and second. So at some point, when you're giving the third angel's message, which you're already still giving the first and second with it, there's an empowerment of the second part. From A to three. The empowerment is of this one. This is the one that's going to be empowered. Does it make sense what I just said? You know what I mean? Yeah, all I, all I wasn't sure is that the empowerment is this one and it receives empowerment when this one comes. I was just going to say Right, that. see, the second one was already there. In a sense, it was there. But then yeah, but it's not being fulfilled. Yeah. Because the fulfillment of the second is, is a specific way mark that we have to deal which with. Is yes, which is the fall of the United States here. Yeah. Which, is, which ties up to yeah. the other. Yeah. In that diagram, when you've got one over the top of two, that, that, no, well, either or, well, I'm talking about the middle one, but down, down yeah. there. So, <laughs> uh, now what I'm trying to say is though, is that in a sense, would it be true to say that's where the second angel arrives and then it's working up to when it's empowered? I haven't put the empowerment in it. No, I know, but is that what yeah. that is? It's the arrival. Yeah. So but, what, the, but I didn't put arrival empowerment because that doesn't serve here, my purpose. I don't want to. No, okay, that's fine. You don't have to. I'm just. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you. I'm just asking though. Is that sort of more when it's empowered as it combines with the third? In when it's See, arrived, you know. No. It's, a right, it's a rifle. Oh, okay. But it's already arrived. Right. Yeah. Okay. Not prophetically. It's not been fulfilled anywhere in this history. Because you can't show where Babylon fell. You have to. You have to. So how do you give the first and second angel's message with the third angel if it's the second angel that hasn't arrived? How do you give the first and second angel's message with the third angel if the second angel hasn't arrived? In which history? Give me a date. That one right there. Where you're here? Saying, yeah, that, that line. This one here? Yeah, you're giving the third angel's message and the third angel's message is inclusive of the first and second. Okay. Well, your words. Yeah, so, okay. how do you... Give the first and second angel's message inclusive of the third if the second angel hasn't arrived. And the first hasn't either. I'm not sure why you target in the second. Well, all right. Exactly. Neither of them have come. So how do you give the third angel's message inclusive of the first and second if the first and second haven't arrived? Because you're saying, what is the third angel's message? The third angel's message is... 2520. Yeah, but, depends, but you've got, you, you got to take, you've got choose the word gospel carefully. This Revelation 14, <coughs> the Son of Law is coming. So this message, the Son of Law is coming all the way through, and you're going to say, well, how do you know the Son of Law is coming? You say, go back to the first and second. Go back to the first and second. Go back to the first and second. It's still not an empowered message. It's only when the first and second come into history in the fulfillment of Revelation 18. In the current history. Then you've got, then it's when these angels join it that you receive the power. Because the first and second that's being dealt with here is still the historical fulfillment right. of it. That's right, and it was never empowered until our history. So, the story of Daniel... I know what you're saying, right? The story of Daniel is how many, the story of how many people? Four. Three friends and Daniel. and Daniel. Because this is Revelation 14, and this is Revelation 18. It's this whole story, Ellen White almost exclusively identifies Revelation 18 as this singular angel, which is why we're in disagreement with the church, because we're making it two angels. One, two, two covering cherubs. We're saying this is the refinement. The reason she's saying this, this one, is because how many messages is it? One message, which is the everlasting gospel. And all of this is also one message, the everlasting gospel. So you see this pattern, this 3-1 combination over and over and over again. Eli and his two sons, Samuel. When you see this 3-1 combination, oh, yeah. it's teaching you this modelling of, of, this, of this everlasting gospel. But Daniel's the easy one to see because you know that story is our story. So 
that's what we've just read here. Um, the third angel's message is to be united with the second angel's message and is to be proclaimed with great power in a large city. Thus will be given with a loud voice the message that is to prepare the people for the coming of the king. So, it's given with a loud voice. So what's given with a loud voice? The second angel's message is given with a loud voice. But it's combined with this third angel, which says, the Sunday law is coming. When you combine that with the collapse of the towers, then you've got a potent message which says, Thus will be given with a loud voice the message to prepare a people for the coming of the king. So now you've got time to prepare for the king when the second angel comes down with his loud voice and empowers the Sunday long message that we've been speaking about since way back here. Because now you know that once this event happened, we're in the final event and we're in the judgment of the living now. So now our message has got power. It's got power because it's been confirmed. Because here... You've got the first angel message going all the way through, but it's only here that it receives power. It's the same issue here. This history here would be, in many ways, all of this, the preamble. First angel message going all the way through, but now it's going to be empowered. But just one more point. You said that this first and second have been tagged along all the way. But the problem is, what have we been doing... <coughs> For the last 145 years, uh -uh. we've been scattered. Yes. We were scattered, yeah. not for quite 145 years because it takes another 19 to get there, but you get all the way to here and then you come to 1989. Then this third angel's message, as you said, has got one and two with it, but essentially it's got one here, but it's not being empowered, so you're in this history here. You have to wait. 1840 to get the power. You have to wait till 9-11 to get the power. So it is there, but it's not empowering. We'll read on. The situation in all the large cities must be studied that the truth may be given to all the people. In these large cities, the Lord has many honest souls who are becoming confused by the strange developments in the religious world. There are many who have been waiting to hear the certain sound of the message that would meet the emergency. So you know that there are many people particularly in Adventism, who are just waiting to hear the certain sound of the message. Now, obviously, if we have time, I like to do testimonies for it. So I'd want to know, my sisters have been waiting to hear this certain sound. I think, how did you get here? <laughs> now, how did all of, all of us got some type of testimony of how we actually got here? We've all been waiting to hear the certain sound. All over our land, the Lord has on his souls who are standing in uncertainty. The words were spoken, repeat the messages in their order. And now it says, repeat the messages in their order. So, this is our license. She says, repeat the message again. If you repeat the message, what must it be? The same message. Yeah. But now she says, repeat the messages in their order. So when you give the third angel's message, as she just told us to, she says this is the message, singular, one message, and now she says, repeat the messages. And we love this next bit. Order. It has to all be in order. One, after uh, one, then two, then three. It has to be in the order. You can't get them out of sync. Tell my people to proclaim the message, the binding off message, that is to proclaim or prepare a people for the coming of the king. Almost the same statement. Give the world a knowledge of the messages of the first, second, and third angels. Bind up the law of my so bind up the law among my disciples. <coughs> and again, this is binding up. There are many who will listen because men will speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You are twenty years behind, but let the warning voice now be heard speaking with the voice of assurance. We're 20 years behind. We should be careful. The message is to be proclaimed with sanctified ability. What does it mean if you're sanctified? Yeah. You're set Righteous. apart for holy use. 
So if you set apart for holy use, are you doing anything unholy? No. So there's no unholiness. And it says, the message is to be proclaimed with sanctified ability. With ability that's not unholy. With ability that you're not using the flesh, worldly techniques, fear mongering, anger, arm twisting, whatever it is you want to do, you can't be presenting the message with that kind of ability. It has to be done in the sense of being sanctified or using holy principles and holy purposes. Any other way it's just not going to work. The word of the Lord has been spoken. God calls for sanctified hearts and lips. The messages of warning are to be given in the large cities and also in the towns and villages. The men of God's appointment are to be zealously at work, disposing of our books and disseminating light. The articles in our papers are not to present the truth in the style of a romance, for this weakens the impression that should be made by the most solemn truth ever committed to mortals. They are to contain the plain, thus saith the Lord. The messages must be re- sorry, the message must be repeated. The Bible reasons given, not in the style of a romance, but in the style of the Bible. There are many who are watching for the evidence of true religion. And we'll pray. Father, we thank you for your watch care over your people. We ask and pray that you would be with us and that you would bless us. Continue to be with us, Father, as we desire to honour you and to glorify your name. Father, we ask for these blessings and ask you to continue to have a watch care over us as we continue to study your word and we see the beauty of these lines and histories being portrayed through these images and being etched into our hearts and our minds. Be with us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name.